when you have this perspective and when you can kind of see a through line, when you actually dig into the scientific literature that's been done, the support is there and the studies are there. It's just a matter of someone being able to look for it with that intention and actually putting it together. Eighty-three percent of Americans identify as not very happy, which can hold you back and negatively affect your relationships and your business. On this podcast, we discuss the proven steps to happiness, so you can restore balance and rekindle your joy. Welcome to another episode of How to Be Happier for Entrepreneurs. This is a special episode today. Today, we have Miok, and she is going to talk to us and tell us about how ayahuasca, plant-based healing, literally saved her life. Welcome, Miok. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Oh, it's such a pleasure to have you. So I found you. Um, you have a story, or Gabor Mate, uh, in his book, his amazing book, which is right behind, If for those of you who are watching, uh, Myth of Normal. What an amazing book. And I'm so grateful to have found you through that book. And I uh, can't wait. We've talked, we've talked once off. Um, man, you have a phenomenal story. And we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. But can you share, or I guess we'll, we'll jump into that. Can you share your personal journey of how writing and healing played a significant role in your life and how it can apply to entrepreneurs or really anyone seeking happiness? Sure. Be happy to. Um, when I was really sick um, and really on death's door, I had been working with the plant medicine ayahuasca uh, with actually with Gabor's help. Uh, he was kind of the only person in my life at the time who had ever even heard of it. This was back in 2013 before the the big psychedelic renaissance. And in those, in those uh, ceremonies, I connected with something very deep inside of me. You can call it the inner child. You can call it my eternal essence or just maybe my essence here uh, in this lifetime. But I had completely forgotten that when I was a child, I had always wanted to be a writer. And I completely lost it. I mean, I, I hadn't re written in 15 years or so. I had sort of petered off in college. And yeah, I just lost that thread. And with this medicine, it just connected me to that. And in that, it connected me to my child's heart in a lot of ways. And it's funny because I actually did start a business with it where I am a writing coach and a book doula. I think for entrepreneurs, there's really nothing better than knowing thyself. It acts as a natural filter with the ex external world when you're really authentic. The people who aren't vibing with you, uh, they just organically drop away. And the people who are attracted to you naturally come closer. And you are able to start off really on the right foot and not waste your time with people who maybe would respond to a persona that you'd previously put out into the world. I think a lot in business is coming across with authenticity. The number one thing in business is trust. You people have to feel like you have integrity. They can trust you. You're going to stick around. And doing this work and being a lot of people, I think, aren't even authentic to themselves. They don't even know. We live unconscious lives, as Gabor Mate talks quite a lot about. And so one of the most difficult things about being an artist in general is finding your voice. And in writing, that's literally your, your voice on the page. And a lot of people have a lot of difficulty finding that. It took me four years to really find, because we have so many selves. You're, you talk to your mother differently than you talk to the school principal or your kid or uh, your partner. And so it, when you're trying to talk to a broad audience, that's the 
that's the challenge, right? And how to come across authentically. So I, I think it can be a good practice just on a, on a number of levels because the personal work does come through when you are trying to provide a service to people and connect with the people that would really benefit from your services. But also it allows you to really express yourself in a way that's in alignment and people, people feel that they connect with that. I love it. Um, so man, you said a lot of great things here. So authentic, uh, being your authentic self, I've learned on my three year journey that that really is true freedom. Um, I used to hide behind alcohol and weed because I couldn't be my authentic self because I didn't like my authentic self, but I didn't even know. So we're, we're, we're wrapping a couple of things in here. Knowing oneself is really important. But now the, the, the true freedom for me came from living in the truth that I was enough and developing self love. And now I can be myself without the, the use of weed and alcohol and nothing outside yourself can ever buy that for you. Money or, or boats or anything, nothing can buy it. So. Um, re- really interesting. Do you think that authenticity is kind of like true freedom? I do think that it's deeply tied to agency because so many of us remain children our whole lives and we never really mature. And we live in a society that tries to keep us as children our whole lives. We're a youth obsessed culture. We don't really confront death. We don't really value aging gracefully anymore. And we live in an era of elders or without elders. uh, And instead we have experts. And so we're not really a wisdom culture. Um, And yeah, I think that in general um, with, with writing and with knowing yourself, you get that opportunity to mature because it's such a powerful medicine. I'm reminded of the philosopher, the French philosopher, Blaise Pascal. And he said that all of man's cuff, all of man's suffering comes from not being able to sit alone in the room. Mm. And that's what writing is. It's sitting, it's processing, and it's really reckoning with yourself to come out into the world, to be a better person and your relationship shift and you shift. It's really a mirror to your subconscious mind, right? And your subconscious mind is the place that holds all that pain and all those limiting beliefs that don't allow oneself to be authentic, right? Yeah. And it's it's really fascinating because there are collective aspects. You are writing alone in a room, but it's in the service of often of sharing, publishing your work and making it public. And then the process in between is working in smaller circles to get feedback and have people mirror for you. And many of those people are strangers and they come from completely different backgrounds and you get to see how your words impact other people and what they pick up from the way you present yourself and your experiences on the page. So people who have never even met you can see very deeply into you. Sometimes I I remember once in a, workshop someone said i you describe everyone so well i can see them in my head but you never once described your mother and i thought oh my god hello freud (laughs) (laughs) so what could you recommend to someone listening right now that they could do tonight or tomorrow to start this journey of happiness through writing journaling is really effective. The page is a very interesting space to allow yourself. It gives a lot of permission for emotions and and your thoughts because we often police our thoughts and not all of that is bad. Sometimes you don't want to hurt someone's feelings. You want to be diplomatic in the way that you say things because you want them to be constructive. But A journal is just for you. It's a place to have a dialogue with yourself. And that can be really powerful medicine just to have. It's kind of like when you're a kid and you have your bedroom and that gets to be your space. And so, yeah, so having um, having a journal practice where you actually just give yourself that time 
as well. Cause a lot of us don't give ourselves time for our self care. And, but yeah, it can be a very spiritual practice. Some people have a ritual around it, but just to have that dedicated time, um, taken for yourself is really powerful. Yeah. In the second week of my coaching program, I have clients start to journal and man, the feedback I've gotten from some of them is like, this is incredible. This is great. So Mio, we have to talk about your story because um, it's just so fascinating. Like I said, it's, it's in this amazing book that Gabor wrote. Can you tell us about your story? Sure. I don't know. Let's see. Well, I'm an, I'm an adoptee from South Korea. I was adopted when I was 14 months old grew up in California. And then my parents, when I was 13, moved to Arkansas. And in those teenage years, I discovered that I was LGBT. So I came out of the closet there in the mid 90s, which was maybe not the best decision. I had grown up very evangelical. And so that kind of started me in a way on my journey. And I had come across a book that had really inspired me called The Secret History by Donna Tartt. And it inspired me to try to go to college in New England and seek the sacred in some way. These people had a magical experience. It's it's also a, a novel, so it's fiction and it's uh, a psychological thriller. So I didn't want all elements of the experience. But I loved this idea of their connection and finding tribe because I, I hadn't found that in in that way while where I was living and in my immediate you know circle of my of my parents in school and I discovered at some point my before my senior year that I had been sexually abused by my adoptive father and that really shot me out of a cannon I ended up becoming a uh, emancipated minor and I ended up getting myself into Boston University with a scholarship. And I lived in Boston and tried to make it there and uh, made plenty of mistakes there as well. And then I got really sick and I was on death's door and I tried everything. I was working at Harvard for a, a famous doctor there and social scientist. And I learned a great deal while I was there, but then one morning I woke up and I couldn't get out of bed. I was in so much pain. And then I got a diagnosis that I had five years to live, that I had a very aggressive uh, form of scleroderma, which is an autoimmune disease. That's really uh, one of the most painful diseases, I'm told. So after running the gamut with that and trying all kinds of uh, medicines that I and seeing tons of specialists at some point, I just decided to fire them all. And I learned about ayahuasca and I started drinking by myself in, in my apartment and it was healing me. But I also knew that I didn't really know what I was doing. I wasn't a big psychonaut before that by any means. And eventually I was able to get to someone who was trained as a practitioner. And because I, I knew that it was, I knew that it was the real deal because I was, I mean, I was in a wheelchair. I couldn't move. Um, I needed to be showered. People were feeding me wow. really, really intense. Wow. It wasn't a regular wheelchair. It was a really intense wheelchair. And the first time I drank ayahuasca, I could stand up and walk by myself, just light as a feather and no pain. So it was, a, it's been a process of healing, but eventually I was able to go to a retreat when Gabor used to host ayahuasca retreats. And I learned so much from him. I learned so much from working with the medicine in a particular tradition. And eventually I started working with uh, indigenous shamans in the Shipibo tradition in Peru. And then I started writing a book. Wow. So Mia, what a story. Um, thank God you're still here. So let's go back to when did you discover that you were um, abused by your father? I was 17 and it was the summer before my senior year. And when, wh what ages were you that the abuse actually happened? I would say before the age of five, I think two to five. Okay. So what led you um, to not have a memory of that, you think, from age five to 17? 
Well, I didn't really have much of a memory before 13. Mm. And I found with this work that it does seem that the brain tries to protect us. And when we have trauma from a like neuroscience point of view, my understanding is that when we have a really, really awful, uh, overwhelming experience, uh, and especially as children, that when our brains are still forming, that the brain will actually isolate those memories, kind of put them in quarantine, because they otherwise will disable us from functioning if we're, if that's really conscious. And, and also we, we tend to block out things that are immediately dangerous to us. And so the closer the abuser is, often it's the harder it is to, to get to, or the more, mo- more beloved the figure is, if it's some spiritual guru or something like that, or a beloved director or someone that you need. And so I think when I've seen other people, or when I've spoken with other people who come out of really awful situations like coming out of Iran during the revolution or, you know, something, something at that level that they often can't remember anything because it's sort of like the brain just does this cost benefit analysis and says, okay, the good memories don't outweigh the bad. So we can go and scrap everything and just put it over here and just move on from this point. Right. So, uh, yeah, I find that with my clients. Um, I use hypnosis as my tool. I am a fan of plant-based medicine and I probably will add it to my toolkit once it's legal. Uh, but right now I use hypnosis and it's super, super, super powerful. And I've had lots of clients that didn't have any memory either until um, we went into this hypnotic state and they were able to access her subconscious mind. So that's really, really, really powerful stuff. So let's fast forward to the illness and the sickness that you endured that almost took your life. What, what do you think was the cause of that? A number of things. I do agree and have, I'm living proof that in a big way, it's how Gabor Mate describes it, that there is trauma. And when you have trauma, when you're suppressing emotions, you're also suppressing the immune system. And eventually the immune system will, um, it can't, it won't be able to function the, in a healthy way anymore. And aside from that, there are also the things that you do in response to trauma. So I think in a, I think it's so apt that he writes a great deal about autoimmune disease and addiction because they're sort of two sides of the same coin to some degree. You, you use addiction to manage the symptoms of the pain and then those will tax your body and tax the immune system even further. So. Yeah, I think some people's experience and and also a lack of guidance on how to manage experiences when you don't have that support, when you when you're feeling like you're alone, feeling alone and being isolated is one of the worst things for your health. So I was the person that if I'd have heard this podcast five years ago, I would have been like, come on, you're <laughs> your childhood trauma being sexually abused by your dad is going to lead you to almost die as an adult. Like, come on, that that's fairy tale stuff because I didn't know I was ignorant. I was not educated. And I've spent the last three years and I've read a lot of Gabor stuff. I've spent thousands of hours on this, on this topic and wow, it's, it's, it's eye opening. And if, if the general public could only understand this more, that yes, your childhood, your unresolved childhood programming and trauma is a cause of your illness. For most people, we have 34%, 33% of Americans on an antidepressant or anti-anxiety drug, and we have 70% of Americans on a prescription drug. Why is that? It's because of all this unresolved childhood trauma and processing that, that has not been processed. Western medicine, as you know, likes to diagnose, label, and then give, give a medication. So, wow, just, just fabulous. And, and I hope that um, someone's mind is changed because 
Um, there's a lot of suffering people out there that have all kinds of autoimmune diseases from Parkinson's to, you know, MS to not even cancer that not that cancer is autoimmune, but, um, or maybe it is, but it, it, it all ties back. And sometimes I quote Gabor and I say that, and I say every child, every, every problem you have is from an unmet childhood need. And man, do I get blasted on the cancer thing? Like you're telling me that, you know, I have cancer and I'm like, well, first of all, I'm not telling you that Gabor is, but I, I believe him. He's a really smart guy. And he's, he's for 40 years, he's seen these patients. He's been there. He's done the research from both the mental side and the physical side. So it's just fascinating to me. He also has that medical background um, so that he can actually delve into the scientific literature. And he's not the only one. There are plenty. Um, there's a, a man, Rediger, who wrote, oh man, what is it called? It's, it's like The Cure, I think. And he he looks at people who have had m- miraculous recoveries. Uh, you know, in, in medical terms, they call them spontaneous remissions. And because of this taboo around anyone stepping outside of that paradigm, no one's ever studied it. And so he decided to. And so when you have these, I, when you have this perspective and when you can kind of see a through line, when you actually dig into the literature, the scientific literature that's been done, the support is there and the studies are there. It's just a matter of someone being able to look for it with that intention and actually putting it together. So you were in some of the most advanced and sophisticated medical centers in the world. Yeah. Did any doctor ever ask you what was your stress level like as a child? What, what, what did you go through anything? Not as a child, but my primary care physician is a pretty remarkable woman. She is also an acupuncturist and an energy worker, as well as a Western trained physician, which is pretty unique. And when I first got sick, she asked me about my diet. She did ask me what was going on in my life at the present to see at any time I really went to her if I was having trouble sleeping or something like that, because she didn't want to just say, Oh, you're having trouble sleeping. Well, there's a pill for that. (laughs) She wanted to see if it was short term. Are you stressed? Oh, you have, this is finals week. Okay. So you're not sleeping a lot. You got a lot on your mind. Let's see how it goes in a week. If, if when you get done with your exams and you crash from them, if you're still having trouble sleeping, then, you know, but she really was, um, you know, more conservative in that respect and really wanted to, I think, honor the the body and take in these external factors of, of what's going on. But uh, all, but you, you probably went to 10, 20, a hundred different doctors that yeah. w- did any of them ever ask you about that? No, no, not one person. So mm-hmm. you, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but I, I think you you said ayahuasca and plant-based medicine basically saved your life. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, because Western medicine couldn't. All they had to do was ask, hey, what what went on? And again, love ayahuasca, but you could have done it through hypnosis. You could have done it through different types of therapy. EMD, but they never asked. It never was brought up. They wanted to go the drug route. So anyway, um, fantastic. I'm so glad that you found that and you had the courage to go that route. So you, well, you that's, mentioned... That's, go a good, that's a good point too, is that there's you know many roads lead to Rome. And... There are so many different modalities and they work for so many different people. And I had, I have done some hypnosis. Uh, I also have hypnotized people. I've done EMDR. I, I really tr- ran the gamut, but ayahuasca was the thing that worked for me. And so you, tr- you tried all these things. I tried it. I tried pretty much everything. Well, I mean, did I you tried try, really, did you try hypnosis. I tried every, I tried really crazy stuff too. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, really wow. out there stuff. Yeah. So you're currently writing a book. Can yeah. you can you give us a sneak peek into the the themes and insights you'll be sharing with readers? Yeah, I think my book is when I think about what it is that I'm doing with it is that I'm I'm healing from a life, and I'm healing from the internalized messages that I received from my family, from my abuse, from the society that we live in. And I've had quite a, quite a go at it. There's, there's an incredible cast of characters and, you know, I mean, it's going from an Arkansas trailer park to 
the halls of Harvard with a $300,000 wooden table in the center of a room in a German mythologies department. (laughs) So it really spans, it spans a great deal of our culture um, from, you know, world renowned emailing with, uh, you know, Nobel prize winners to hanging out with, uh, drag queens with HIV. And, and I think for the most part, it's a lot of it is about certain people who come in with the things that the structure or society require us to have, um, or that give us a little bit of head, like having a family, um, being a certain skin color or a certain, um, having certain abilities, um, that, that don't push us in the margins, like having a, a mental illness or something like that, uh, having a physical disability. And so I think that it, it kind of, it speaks to my experience of why do I have to figure out why I get to be here when other people seem to never ask themselves that question? Why do I have to create my own space? Uh, just to exist? And why do people uh, deny my existence? Usually it's because it threatens their own it, or their own sense of who they are, things like that. And so in a way, it's, it's, it's really, I hope, an adventure and an inquiry that is, that taps into universals because ultimately the story that I'm telling is the story of the outsider. And that's something I think everybody feels, no matter how much they look like they belong to a group. That's the authenticity piece that we were talking about. And learning to, you know, the more, the more different you have, the more dimensions that don't fit into the structure, the more you suppress in order to survive, especially as a child. And so it's really, it's the story of it's, of amazing synchronicities and bizarre circumstances and learning and growing that I had to do to come from what you were talking about, you know, Harvard's going to figure this out. It's going to, you know, that's the end of the, of the road. And that journey of switching, of going from that mindset and, and actually experiencing its limitations and the people in it and the thinking, the way that it's thought and having to, go into places that I old me would have made fun of so much yeah. <laughs> and it's being woo woo and all those things and finding a truth and, and feeling that truth in my body because you can't I, argue with results. I would have done the same thing, judging and making fun of, and now man, has it changed my life and yeah. I give it to other people. And some people think it's crazy and woo woo and that's okay. They, they get to decide that. So Mio, tell us what you do now for your clients. I do a number of things. I help with sacred medicine support. I help people prepare how to deepen their experiences. And then after they've had these powerful experiences, help them to process them. Because sometimes it's like, what what was that? Um, But then also to take the gold that was extracted from those experiences and, and turn it into lasting transformation because so often it can be fleeting. You're kind of on this high of like, yeah, I felt universal love and, you know, connected with, with the divine or with my inner child or something like that. And, and then you go back to real life and you're like, Oh God, now I have to talk to my brother-in-law or whatever it is. And it's, it's hard to stay in that place. So I really help people. Um, I really help support people in their process. And I really try to help people discover their process. I think of myself as someone with um, a very powerful flashlight, but they lead the way. And, you know, I'm, I just try to try to be there and I try to see what their needs are that maybe they're unconscious of and encourage different things, but really asking them questions that they may not have thought and sometimes consulting, sometimes uh, giving them information that might help them understand what's going on in their lives or what happened in their experiences a little bit better 
I also do general life coaching and really I'm into the transformation of it. So people who are looking to make a change, a career change, uh, or relationship change, I, I love to support people in, in their process, uh, so that people can become more empowered and have more agency and have more authenticity. And with the writing, that's what it's all about too. In a way, I'm, I'm trying to get out of the way to some degree and encouraging and also guiding them and, and doing very technical things, editing, helping them, uh, giving, giving them reading assignments to make them better writers. And, but the writing is, is both for writers and for non writers. There's sort of two levels that I work, that I work on. One is, People who, who say, you know, I've, I've, I've got a book inside me and we got to get it out. That's so me. <laughs> I, I love, I love helping with that. I love, I love helping people think through and learning how to write if they're not a writer, but they have something to say. And then I also work with people who consider themselves writers and telling that, telling their stories in, uh, in a significant way. And then I also use writing. I, I lead workshops where, um, people who maybe they just journal and they have no interest in ever publishing anything or, or going down that path professionally using prompts and holding space for that self exploration and just having a place of non judgment and permission that, uh, that I've developed in a large part through uh, the philosophy uh, of my training with with Gabor's compassionate inquiry, which is a psychotherapeutic approach. And I just try to bring in all of these tools that I've learned, some of them shamanic, some of them just highly technical MFA writing program stuff. And, but really considering the whole human and also helping to elevate consciousness while we're at it. So you help people, you, you use the word sacred, um, was it sacred medicine healing you used? Yeah. So it's just AKA uh, plant-based healing or ayahuasca psilocybin. So I just want to make sure every, everyone um, hears that. So we usually try to keep these to 30 minutes. We're a couple minutes over, but I just want you to spend a couple minutes because you and I are so fond of Dr. Gabor Mate. He's really st- has shaped my transformation these last three years. I know he's has as well as you. Um, and I'm so jealous that you're going to be getting on a Zoom call with him soon. I haven't, <laughs> met, I haven't met him in person and I can't wait to meet him in person. Can you just tell us the the, the best of, um, of Gabor in, in the next two or three minutes, please? Yeah. You know, everyone is a person. And we all, it's it's not to say we don't all have our heroes and it's not to say that there aren't people that deserve the respect that they get. But what I really, when I met Gabor, I was really on my way out. I was very weak and I, you can kind of feel death coming. Uh, you can feel the body start starting to leave you. And so when I first met him, I was about to die and he was, I knew he was very well known in Canada, um, but I hadn't heard of him before. And when we spoke, when you're about to die, no one's famous. Like even really famous, like Brad Pitt could have walked into my hospital yeah. and it would, it would feel like someone who's famous in another country who I'd never heard of. It's like, great. Yeah. Um, and so I think that he is one of the most compassionate people that I've met. It, it At times it feels bottomless when I've wow. seen him work and he has a real clarity when he's at his best uh, to see the human behind the pain that the rest of the room could be getting massively triggered by, but he, he has this laser focus on the trauma and the child that's in their suffering he he also has, as you know, a real gift for speaking and words and synthesizing and bringing things together. And, uh, you know, he does, uh, it, you know, and he'll admit this, that he overextends himself. But I think it's because of his good heart and because he has had some great fortune and he wants to use it in the 
in the best places that he can. And, but yeah, he's, he's, he's also a lot of, he's also very funny. I think he's very funny. He is. He is. Um, how do people reach you, Miyok? Uh, they can go to my website, holdingcompassionate.space. Holdingcompassionate.space. Yep. And uh, they'll, uh, by the end of this weekend, they should be able to see a, a video of Gabor on it too. Um, yeah. And that's where I talk about my services and uh, yeah. And anyone can just reach out to say hi. Um Anyone who wants to have me uh, speak or run a workshop or be on a podcast can reach out there. I do offer 20 minute uh, complimentary consultations for anyone who just wants to see if we vibe, if we connect and see if I think I can help them in some way. And so, yeah, that's that's where I live in the virtual world. Love it. Love it. Well, what, a, what an inspiring story. And like I said, I'm so glad you're here doing the work that you're doing. And I'm grateful to have met you. And I, I know our relationship will continue on to the year. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. That concludes another episode of How to Be Happier for Entrepreneurs. If you can share the love by sharing this and rating and reviewing it so we can get this out to, to more people that are suffering so they can find happiness and joy, that would be much appreciated. Till next time, love heals all. Hit subscribe if you don't want to miss out on more life-changing content. And if you're struggling, you don't have to. Go to bradchandler.com slash contact. There, you can join the Facebook community of like-minded entrepreneurs, and you'll see a button to schedule your freedom and happiness call. See you on the next episode.